Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so, um, as you know, there's a, um, a homework that is due this, uh, this weekend, um, E2. So that is your opportunity to get to play with sliders and look up tables and delays um, in sort of a two-part problem. Um, so that's due this upcoming weekend. And then our last homework assignment will be this, this homework assignment, which pretty much we're spending the day describing assignment E5. After that, um, your time is spent working on your final projects, really. I mean, there's going to be uh, readings, but um, the, the actual sort of VinSim work and Insight Maker work will be focused on your final project. So <clears throat> just jump right into that. Um, so this assignment here is meant to be kind of a, to give you an idea of roughly the scope of what I would expect out of a system dynamics model for your final project. And so I'm expecting you to have a couple of sectors, not a whole lot of stocks, but three or four stocks, um, interconnections, something that's complex enough to generate um, interesting results, kind of similar to the results that we saw in the last lecture at the end there, where they could use two sliders to create sort of four regimes to try to understand what might happen if they underinvested or overinvested um, based on the how quickly the um, other uh, group would retaliate. So the motivation behind this is again, multi-sector. And again, thinking about last time, um, it, you know, we, last time we started with uh, a sector, a growth sector inside EasyJet. So we're modeling just this focal company that we were trying to do strategic modeling for. So we had that sector. And then we also built a sector of their rival. And so we didn't have to model all of the details that go on in the rivals. We had to model enough to sort of give us a response to actions made inside the partner that we cared about. And then there were um, a connection between those two and then some additional complicating processes gonna add it on to that. And that's what we're gonna see in this assignment. This is an assignment that is meant to model a city like Phoenix that has water limitations. So it's growing, but maybe it has limited water ability. Um, it is not, I would say a good, it's a very contrived model. This is, I think, not a good model um, and I do that on purpose, like because I, I don't want to sort of take away the opportunity for you to model, you know, Phoenix and water limitation or whatever. So I've kind of come up with sort of a bad model, but it's, it has, you know, it's it's the same level of complexity. So it's certainly the model that is going to be presented that you're going to build and work with in assignment E5 has got a lot that you could criticize about it. So that's not what you're supposed to sort of be picking out of it. Um, we're supposed to be getting with it is like, this is how I might build a model from starting with building one sector, another sector, connecting together and doing a little analysis on it. So again, this motivated motivated by um, <clears throat> this process where at the end of last time we had this kind of easy jet, we looked at sort of what some of the stock and flow uh, models might look like. We didn't look at all of them together, um, but um, that's what you're gonna be building in this assignment E5. So in E5, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna have one sector, which is going to be a population of a city. So um, one thing that we're definitely gonna have here is a population stock, a birth stock and a death stock. And what you're gonna find in E5 is that for the most part, it's written like a recipe. So I give you almost every step you need to build it. And then at a couple points, you have to fill in a formula based on, you know that'll be the exercise there. So. A lot of this, like the, the large scale things I give you, and you just have to follow the steps and walk through them, but then the, occasionally you'll have to fill in a formula based on your best guess and those sorts of things. So, and we're gonna talk about some of those formulas here in this uh, presentation. So I give you a lot of help on it. So with the build a population sector, so it's definitely gonna have births and deaths. And the thing that um, you'll do in the assignment then is to then create the complicated coordinating network that relates births, deaths, uh, and population, and eventually um, water. And we are not going to use some of the simple birth death formulas that we've seen um, so far, like in the bacterial case. We are going to use a lookup table that will end up coordinating these things together. And so we'll see um, how that works. Then we're gonna have a second sector 
that's our water supply. And it's gonna have two stocks, treated water and untreated water. And <clears throat> as the population oh, that'll be over here uses water, then it gets converted from one stock to the other. And then there is some rate that it gets treated to come back into here. So, um, you know, in real cities, like um, we don't at this moment, we don't, um, this isn't exactly how we get water back into the system. And usually there's a lot of ecological processes that go from, uh, you know, the, the untreated water, you know, coming finally back into the stuff that people drink. But, you know, they're experimenting with that. And we're just sort of simplifying all of that by saying that when water gets used, um, water never disappears in this system, but it is unusable and then becomes usable again after some treatment there. Um, and then we will create a connection between these sectors and the assignment. And, um, and then as a bonus on this assignment, you'll have the opportunity to expand the boundaries of this model and add other complicating processes that you don't think are represented in the recipe that I've given. And I, um, you know, so you might add uh, the effective temperature or something like that. Something simple um, for this model. This model isn't your final project. It's just trying to bring you into the mindset of what your final project might look like. So, um, and the other bonus question we'll have on this is, and this again is trying to model what you might do in your final project, is to try to come up with justifications, say from the web, um, for uh, parameter use. So you might say like, um, my birth, the birth rate here um, is, or maybe the death rate, you could base that off of the average lifetime for someone who lives in Phoenix. Well, so you could go and look that up and say, well, I chose, a, uh, a death rate of one over whatever, 82, um, because the average person in Phoenix um, lives to uh, you know 82 years. I don't know if that's actually true, but you can look that up and then you can sort of justify, that's how I chose this parameter. And then in the terms of birth rate, we'll see what goes into the kind of complicated way that uh, births will, um, the formula here, and you could then sort of justify some of the choices there. Or you could say in this water use, like as I, as I looked up that the average person uses this many gallons of water per year, and that's how I chose this parameter and so on. So show me some justification. And those are the type of things I'm hoping you'll do on your final project as well. Justify your parameter choices. All right, so we're going to step through um, some of the... <clears throat> some of the trickier parts of that assignment, so we're all prepared for it. But are there any questions about the general outline of what we're gonna be doing in this assignment? It's kind of just building a, a city system here. Okay. All right, so, um, so some things like I don't give you the birth rate in the assignment, but we're gonna talk through what a birth rate formula might look like here. And you could totally use the one that we have here. So when you get to that part in the assignment, um, then you can you know, go back to the lecture and then you know, try to fill in there, or you can sort of try to fill it in from memory here. So um, you know, if we think about it per person, um, we have to decide you know, what is the average per person birth rate? That's what we would put into the model. Now, um, you might be tempted to say, well, maybe maybe you look it up online and you can say the average um, the average child uh, producing person in the United States produces two children over their lifetime. And so you might be tempted to say, oh, I'll just put two in there because they put, produce two children per person. But you have to realize this is this is per year per person. These rates are per unit time. And so, um, you have to make sure that if you have picked a parameter that is over a whole lifetime, that you don't put two here, that you do two divided by that lifetime, for example. So we'll get into that. But right here, I'm just hoping that you would spot that this is way too fast. Because if our units are two children per year per person, like that would be like rabbits, right? So It'd be like every person every year would have two more children, and then the next year, two more children, and the next year, two more children, and that doesn't match reality at all. So just because you found a two somewhere um, when you're looking up what the, the, the average birth rate is for uh, you know, the U.S. population or the Phoenix population, um, and you'll see like replacement rates and things like that referenced and all that, and it's two or 2.1 will keep coming up, and then you might be tempted to just put a two in there, but that's you, you can't use two by itself it's got to be conditioned and that's what we're going to talk about here so this is way too fast so um 
you know, so this doesn't seem realistic. Every year, every individual produces two children. That's not right. So we think, well, how do um, we fix this? Well, let's think about where that two came from here. Well, we could say, well, maybe this is two children every year for life is probably too frequently. So maybe what we mean, um, and also that's, so that's, you know, what, so this is the first criticism that I already mentioned. The other criticism here is that every individual in the population isn't producing offspring. So when we average out of these things, we have to realize that um, this average is gonna also account for people who don't produce offspring. So um, how do we come up with a more realistic formula? So this is kind of like unit conversions in chemistry. You have to combine all these assumptions until you get all the units right and everything multiplies through and everything matches. So we're gonna make some assumptions here. Humans have to form pairs to produce offspring. So that's our first assumption. They're not um, asexually producing uh, bacteria. And we're saying that every pair of humans produces two offspring over their lifetime on average. So we're gonna talk about issues with these assumptions in just a second, but this, we just are starting with something. And so this is the, the model that we're starting with. Every pair lives around 70 years. Um, and then, so this is, these are the assumptions that we can use to build this formula. Now, like I said, there are problems with these assumptions. So for one, um, you know, that, you know, it may be that uh, the pairs that form are not necessarily child producing pairs. And so if we wanted to make this more realistic, then we would need to scale the number of humans um, down to sort of an effective population size, representing that, you know, even though there are 300 million uh, humans maybe in the United States, uh, not all of them are of child, uh, you know, raising up uh, uh, child rearing age, and not all of them are going to form pairs. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why um, that you know, not all of those who are maybe biologically capable of producing offspring are going to produce offspring. And there's going to be plenty of people who aren't biologically capable of producing offspring. So there's probably more that we could add here to make this more realistic. Um, there could be demographic differences in offspring production. So it might be that people of certain socioeconomic status produce more offspring than others. And we are not accounting for that here. We could imagine building a complex population model where we have sort of uh, low SES, low social economic status, uh, moderate social economic status, high social economic status, and each one of them have a different birth rate. That could be one way we could handle that. We're not gonna deal with that here. It's a very simple population. Um, also lifetime. So there could be demographic differences in lifetime. So low SES might live a different amount of time than high SES. Um, and then there can be multiple pairings too. So it may not be one pair per life. Um, so there's a lot of things that can kind of upset these numbers. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. We don't know if this approximation is going to be useful enough. We know though, it's gonna be a lot better than assuming every individual has two offspring per year, every year of their life. So, so it's a good start. So that's why we might start with this. So how do we combine those together? Well, if I want average per person birth rate, I can think about breaking that up. Again, this looks like a chemistry problem or something. And I can say that, well, if I look at all my assumptions, I can turn those into these little subparameters that I can multiply together to get the birth rate that I want. So I've got up here that every pair produces two offspring and I've got that humans have to form pairs. Well, um, I've got these color coded. So this magenta one here, humans have to form pairs of her offspring. Well, I know that there's one pair per two people. So just to get my units right, if I look, this blue one, it's got two children per pair, but I know that ultimately I want this per person. Well, how do I convert pair to people? Well, that's this one, one pair per two people. So, um, so that will end up doing, uh, you know, this pair will end up canceling with this pair. But then um, I don't want this in lifetime units. I want this in year unit. Well, how many years is a lifetime? Well, one lifetime is 70 years. So overall, this is all just kind of a unit conversion exercise to change two children per lifetime per pair into what's the average zoom type number of children that each individual is sort of helping with um, per unit time per year. And so it's effectively going to scale this two down to be very, very small. So let's see how that works. So if I put all that together, here's my two children per pair per lifetime. 
Um, now, each pair is um, represents two people. So um, for this 0.5 here represents one pair per two people. So these two children come from two people, and that's the reason why this is two times 0.5. It's actually like two times one over two. And then this over here, these are in lifetime units, so I need to convert them to year units. Well, this is one lifetime per 70 years. So I put all that together, and what I effectively get is these two will cancel, and I end up getting one divided by 70 children per person per year. So that's how I combine these assumptions up here to get them into the units I want. And now I see that every individual contributes far less than they did. It makes a lot more sense to say every individual in the population contributes 1 70th of a child per year, as opposed to two children every year. So does that make sense so far? How we go from like, these are data that we could go onto Google and look up and we can combine them together. Again, like we're in like, a chemistry class like Chem 101 or whatever the number is here at ASU, and we're doing sort of like balancing units and all that so that we get the units out that we want. And the units we out we want are um, the number of children per person. And, um, and if I combine all these, I can get the number of children per person per year, and it ends up being this quantity right here. And that's what I can put in as my birth rate formula. So questions on how we got that. So in your model, um, you may choose to put a different number here. It doesn't have to be 70. Could be whatever uh, you end up looking at the average lifetime is. You might say that actually um, in Phoenix, the average pair produces 2.7 children or 1.9 children. Um, you know, and then you could even play around with, um, you know, you'd have to justify it like this 0.5. Like um, maybe uh, you can say that it actually, um, because not every person in the population contributes to um, a, a, a child producing pair bond, then you could say this is almost like the probability that any person in the population lands in a child producing pair bond. And so if everyone's heterosexual and producing a, child, a child, then it's a 50 percent probability for each person. But if you consider a more realistic population, maybe it's actually more like 25 percent. Um, because some people, you know, just end up not landing in that type of pair bond or don't land in a pair bond at all. So, um, so you can imagine scaling these things and that's totally fine. Okay. So, um, so that's what you'd end up putting in as your formula in Bin Sim or Insight Maker. And then um, once you've got this birth rate, then in your births flow in that stock and flow model, you'd multiply it by the population. And that would actually then get rid of the, uh, since population is in person units, would get rid of this. And then they would turn into birth would just be in children per year. And that would tell you um, how things grow, how the population grows over time. Okay, so flow rate, children per year. All right, so questions about forming the birth, uh, the births formulas here, and specifically the birth rate formula. That's one that won't be written on the, the um, won't be written on the assignment, but you can at least as a start go and use um, this formula. Um, you know, and you know, so you could go back to this slide and grab that formula exactly, or you could come up with your own that is sort of built in a similar way. But you have to kind of justify where it comes from. Okay. Questions online? All right, the other thing um, we you know, might have forgotten about because we haven't done it for a while, but definitely make sure you remember to set your, your DT, your time step, and your time units. So uh, the default time step in VinSim is one, and the default unit for time is second. For this model, seconds probably doesn't make sense. So maybe you need to set it to years. Um, and um, for a time step here, um, you know, it, you might get some weird results. Um, if you leave the time step set to one, you might need to set it to point one. You might you know, remember to have to set it lower. So um, when we're, this model will have what we call nonlinearities. And what happens with nonlinearities is that if you make your time steps too big, like 
in the examples I've shown you so far, all of the equations were so-called linear, and we can talk about what that means if necessary. But with these linear systems, then um, if you make your time step too big, the shape of the, the trajectories look about the same. They just kind of don't scale right. With nonlinear systems, if you make your time step too big, you get a totally different result out. So as you make your time step smaller and smaller and smaller, you actually start getting sometimes qualitatively different behaviors over time. So you want to make sure that your time step isn't uh, too large. If you're getting weird errors and things like that, that's one of the things you should definitely check out is maybe my time step is too large. Okay. So an insight maker, same deal. The default time in the time simulation time step is one and seconds. Again, you probably want to change those. So the other thing, converters and lookup tables. You'll definitely use those again on this assignment. So hopefully um, we'll, you'll feel um, more comfortable with this after the assignment E2. But remember, you in, um, in VinSim, you open up a variable, you leave the type set to auxiliary, and you set the subtype to with lookup in order to make this work. Avoid the lookup button at, uh, you know, on the VinSim canvas. And instead, um, you know, just draw a normal variable, a normal auxiliary variable, uh, bring it in, and then change the subtype from, I think it's called like normal or whatever, I forget what the normal, the default subtype is, to lookup table, to turn it into a lookup table. And then um, in the top box in VinSim, you just you know copy whatever the input is that's going into there. And, um, and then the bottom box will get filled out by the as graph. So if you go to that as graph button, you'll be able to put in your lookup table. So this is the example for the fish one. So for those of you still doing E2, if you haven't entered in your lookup table, this is what you'd enter in basically for your lookup table. Although, again, I think I left out one point, but, um, but basically it'll be the same because the one point I left out is right on this line that's filled in there. So it's kind of a gratuitous point anyway. Um, so you set up your lookup tables, you make sure you set the Y range and the X range. That's gonna be really important is like, if you have a lookup table in terms of density, make sure it goes from zero to one because density could be any value between zero and one. So if your lookup table doesn't isn't defined all the way from zero to one, you'll get an error if your density crosses one of those boundaries. And it might be that there's some other problem in your system that causes your density, causes your population to go negative, for example. And if that happens, then um, your density will go negative as well. And so if you get an error in that case, and it's probably not a problem with your lookup table. It's a problem with something else in your system that's causing your population to go negative. So, um, so make sure you set those ranges correctly. If you don't, you'll get an error. But you can also get very similar errors if there's something wrong with your sim and it goes outside of the range where your lookup table is defined. So any questions about lookup tables? I know that these are, you've had less practice with them. And hopefully those who've tried E2 have, um, have gotten these to work. Yeah. Um, you, you mean like, oh, you mean like back, um, back on, on this page here? Yeah. So after you're done with that as graph, it's going to, dump it into this thing here and it looks like just a bunch of numbers but if you focus in on it the first numbers are the lower corner and the upper corner of the lookup table so this is zero zero for those who can't read it and one six hundred if i were to go back here i can see that my lower input is zero zero and this goes all the way up to 600 so it's like i've defined zero zero as this corner and one 600 is this corner. And that's just for visualization. It doesn't actually change anything. It's just to, it just, it helps Vincent remember that when you click as graph, it should show it this way. Then the rest of these, um, everything else outside of the square brackets, like here are just the points in the lookup table. So if I go back here, I can see 00, 0 0.2100, 0 0.3200, all the way down to one zero. And if I go to the finished version here, there's my zero zero, there's my point to 100, it goes all the way to the one zero. So it's just a list of those points. So if you're looking at assignment E2, um, I've given you, um, well, I've given you copied Moorcroft's 
um, stock and flow model for the fishery, and I've given you his equations. And in one of his equations for net regeneration, it says graph, and then it has in parentheses and a bunch of points. That's basically Stella, their version of this. And so if you wanted to, you could actually just type in all those points here if you got the syntax right, uh, or you could just read off those points and go back to the as graph and type them in one by one. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any questions online have been generated? Everybody good? And again, the camera seems to have died. So, uh, but the screen share, I think, is still working. It's actually not the camera that's died, it's the meeting room. So, it's too difficult for me to get the number back. Okay. Um, and then, so same thing in Insight Maker, uh, you add a converter this funny little shape um, and uh, you can choose its input source to be something other than time. Um, so, and you can choose its interpolation to be linear and that will make it just like VinSim or you can choose its interpolation to be none and that will give it this kind of squared uh, look off look where each one of your points holds the previous value until the next point. But otherwise it works just like VinSim. So any questions on lookup tables? Any other questions? So you will use, I think, two lookup tables in the E5 assignment. And these are lookup tables where you're gonna have to come up with them yourself. So I don't give you the points, I give you the outline. I say like, come up with a lookup table that starts at this point, ends at this point, and generally has this shape. And then, so you're gonna have to draw one that's like that. Okay. All right, so then the, um, Next thing, um, ghost variables. You will use shadow variables or ghost primitives in this upcoming assignment too. In VinSim, you go to the shadow variable. In the newer versions of VinSim, there's also this additional button that looks like the shadow variable button where it's called like existing variable or something like that. Ignore that. Um, that's kind of a little more advanced from when you create multiple uh, views in the canvas. Um, so we just focus on the shadow variable here. You click on the shadow variable, you click on a spot on the canvas, and then it'll pop up a, um, a, a list of all of the existing variables um, in the sim, plus uh, additional ones that are hidden behind the scenes, like the time variable. And so um, that allows you to create an alias to these existing variables located elsewhere in the canvas. So this is a great way to connect to sectors so you can draw your city sector like up here in this corner and your water sector down here and at some point the population needs to connect to the water well you could draw a line going all the way across your canvas or you could create a copy of population down here and draw a little line here and that kind of keeps the sector view so you can kind of like keep the population separate from the water, they'll still dynamically, like behind the scenes, they'll be connected, but you won't get these ugly connections going way across the canvas, um, you know, this way. So it'll, you can kind of maintain um, an abstract boundary between the two of them, which just sometimes helps with readability. So that's what we do with shadow variables. So they prevent uh, crossing a whole bunch of wires on a diagram. And then of course, they also can allow you to access time. So. Yeah. And then in um, Insight Maker, they're called ghost primitives. It's the same idea. Click on a variable, add primitive, ghost primitive. It'll create, um, as they say, a linked alias. So it's kind of a kind of a, a little bit of a, it's kind of Halloween appropriate. It's you know it sort of looks just like it, but it's sort of ghostly. And um, so then you can drag that and put that anywhere. And then any arrows coming in are equivalent to arrows coming into this one and arrows going out same thing equivalent to arrows coming out of that one so they always match they're just uh, graphically shown in two places even though it's actually one entity so any questions on what i mean by ghost variables or shadow variables just to clean up the canvas questions online and you will use those yeah go ahead Mm -hmm. no, no, you can have fixed or smoothing delays. Um, the, so the way the way ghost variables came up in, I think, in the delay talk was 
uh, was we created these inputs that were sort of like injections into the system. So I wanted to say at time five, put a pulse of customers into the system or a pulse of food into the system. And so I created a little variable which had a, a lookup table based on time just to send that in. But the delay was sort of downstream to that. So it's almost like um, in this particular case here, if I wanted this interest rate um, to lag this interest rate here, like actually the interest rate changed in January, but I don't feel it until February, then inside the formula for interest, I would say there's a fixed or smoothing delay of variable interest rate. So I could actually have the variable interest rate changing in January, but inside the formula for interest, it would use a month delayed version of it so that it wouldn't feel it until a month later. So we don't need lookup table, or we don't need, yeah, we don't need lookup tables and we don't need ghost primitives for delays. We can implement delays anywhere we want. It's just, um, you, you just anywhere there's an expression, anywhere there's a formula, you can put fixed delay or smooth and it'll work the same way. Uh, anything that's going into the, yeah, so the, you can say if, if you wanted this flow, if it wanted to use a delayed version of anything coming into it, then you probably would also have like a time constant or delay parameter unless you hard coded inside there. But yeah, that would usually be the thing is if I looked at the formula for interest, it would probably say fixed delay. And then in parentheses, it would say variable interest rate because that's what's coming into there. And then it, instead of using the interest rate immediately, um, as it will, like if this interest rate changed, instead of immediately incorporating that, it would always be kind of a step behind using an older interest rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. That's what you'll see with um, uh, with this assignment is you'll you'll build a kind of a population stock and flow diagram up here and you'll build a water stock and flow diagram up down here. And you could actually like create a new Vincent model that's just the water one where you fix the population as like an exogenous variable, run your water one. And then once it's working, you could copy and paste that stock and flow diagram onto this canvas. And then, um, and then where population was an exogenous variable, you just delete that population variable and create a ghost variable instead. And then they're connected up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Great. Okay. So, um, so this is um, not going to be used on assignment E five, but this is something that often comes up on final projects, and it really relates to these last couple of questions about ghost variables and lookup tables. Um, we're simulating this city, let's say Phoenix. Now we're centering water use. Well, yeah, water use works too. Like in Phoenix, we use a lot more water in the summer than we do in the winter because uh, you have to irrigate a lot more and you lose a lot more water to, um, especially if it's not flood irrigation, you lose a lot more water um, to evaporation. So there's a lot of reasons why you use more water in the summer than you do in the winter. So if you were going to um, you know, talk about water usage per person, you might want that to vary seasonally where there's always some non-zero water use, but sometimes it's higher and sometimes it's lower. So how would you implement seasonality inside these things? Well, we can do that inside both Insight Maker and Vincent. And this is a, a, a funny little trick uh, to it. So, um, so what we're going to do is create a time function that as time marches on in one direction, we're going to create what I'm calling here a cyclic time that pretty much just tells you like the month of the year. So even though the time behind the scenes is gonna give you months since the beginning of the sim from zero to infinity, as long as the sim runs, cyclic time will say, I'll tell you which month it is in year, January, February, whatever. And if you have this time variable that only goes from like zero to 11.9, like, you know, so that, you know, the beginning of the year is zero, 11.9999 is the end of the year. Um, if it, as it goes back and forth between that, you'll be able to run that into a lookup table that allow you to say, here's my water use in January, here's my water use in February, and so on. And then it'll change the water uses over and over again inside the year. 
So that's what our desired thing is, this dynamic variable that counts up to a limit and then resets. That's what we're going to do. And then we're going to couple it with a lookup table that allows us to implement an arbitrary pattern of usage. Let's say water usage in the winter versus water usage in the summer. And so how do we do that? Well, in Insight Maker, um, we can go into create a variable called cyclic time. You can go into its equation. We click on the little sigma to open up all of its, um, its functions. Under time functions, under the category, there is something called month. Now, months gives you the number of months since the beginning of the sim. So that's not cyclic. It'll just keep climbing, you know, higher and higher and higher the longer you run the sim. But we're going to combine it with, uh, so this is me just highlighting that months exist there. So there's a bunch of functions here that, you know, you can do seconds since the beginning of the sim, minutes, hours, days, weeks. So you can choose the current time. Uh, you can choose uh, what, how you want time to be returned to you. But then, you know, so I'm going to choose months. Now, um, I, there's this funny little thing called mod. So this is short for modulus or modulo. And the modulus or modulo, uh, so months mod 12, this gives you the remainder when you divide months by 12, the remainder. So, um, and, and this is a remainder, not just like normally we think of remainders and division, it's like going to be an integer or something. It's, you know, like, you know, uh, if I did, you know, five uh, divided by three, you know, I'll get one with a remainder of two. Well, if I do 5.5 divided by three, I'll get one with a remainder of 2.5. So that's what's going on here. So whatever months is, if months is less than 12, this is just going to give you exactly what months is. But once months hits 12, it basically resets. So um, when months is equal to 12, 12 mod 12 gives me zero. When months is equal to 13, 13 mod 12 is going to give me one. So I think I've got this mapped out here. So um, if months is climbing up to infinity, months mod 12 starts matching, but at the instant it hits 12, it goes back to zero. And if, um, and then so if I add the sort of integer or the fractional part here too, um, this months is going to climb up and it's going to have fractional parts in time, so half a month or whatever. But similarly, um, you know, where they match up 11.5, 11.5, the instant it's 12, it goes down to zero. So 12.5 months mod 12 gives me 0.5. And so now this um, implemented cyclic time is even though the time is climbing up to infinity, this months mod 12 is going to always tell me what month I'm in and even down to where in the month am I? So this is kind of, it, it always tells you, you know, am I in, uh, this is, I'm in January here from zero to 1.5 or zero to Anytime between zero and one, I'm in January. Anytime between one and two, I'm in February, and so on. So all the way up from 11 to 12 is all the way through December. But the instant I hit 12, that's like the, the year rolling over. And then now I'm back in January again. So does this formula make sense? I'll show you how we use it with a lookup table next. But I just want to make sure we get the math here that this term mod is just instead of dividing and, um, and taking the results, we divide, throw away the normal result and just take the remainder. Okay. So we now can take that and build a lookup table. And this lookup table only has to be defined from zero to 12. That's the beauty of it. Our simulation might run for 10 years, 10 years, that's 120 months. And if we didn't have this cyclic time, we would have to define this lookup table for all 120 months, you know, even if it's just going to be the same pattern over and over again. So this allows us to define the pattern once, and um, and then the sim will constantly keep going back. And so when it hits 12, it'll go back to zero again and go down through here. So we could call this, you know, this might be, um, you know, like these are sort of um, winter months or whatever. What I mean, it just depends, depends on where we start the sim. Like, let's say the zero is the beginning of the summer or something like that. Well, this might be water usage until, um, you know, roughly the end of the summer. And then as fall hits, the water usage goes back down again or something along those lines. So if zero represents, I don't know, June, then this might be the water usage pattern, um, you know, until the next June. And then it goes back up again. So and then we'll get this pattern over and over and over again. I think I have a sim of that. So that's, I think I've, yeah. So lookup table is only defined from zero to 12. And then 
this is an example. I run this sim, and if I plot the cyclic time and the repeating pattern, the cyclic time is this uh, nice green bar that rises smoothly up to 12 and then resets. And then the repeating pattern, that's this blue curve. And you can see it walks through the lookup table and then it walks through the lookup table again. And that's how you implement seasonality in one of these dynamical systems models. So questions on that. Trick was creating the cyclic time. And then after that, it's just, it simplifies the use of the lookup table. Any questions online? Okay. And we can do the same thing in VinSim. Um, it's a little uh, uglier in VinSim, but it works basically the same way. You have to go into your model settings and you make sure that your units have to be small enough to capture the repeating phenomenon. So if you want, um, if you want this pattern to repeat in months, then um, it's you need to make sure this is sort of small enough to be months or smaller. So you don't want this to be years if you want to try to define a pattern that's on a month scale. Uh, so months or smaller. So um, if instead you want something to be like a decade revolution, then you could make this years, but you wouldn't want it to be larger than a decade. So in this case, we could change this to months or smaller. And then um, we do a same type of thing. We create a shadow variable for time and we drag it into a variable I'll call repeating pattern. And, um, and so um, I'm kind of combining the cyclic time and the lookup table all in one. So this repeating pattern, this variable, I'm saying it's an auxiliary with lookup, but here's the trick. In the input to the lookup table, I don't just use raw time. I use VinSim's version of the modulo. And so in Vince, so an insight maker, I would do time or months mod 12. The way I write that in VinSim is with this modulo function, where I do modulo time 12. And that just means the same thing as time mod 12 in insight maker. It's just written a little bit differently. But I run that as the input to my lookup table instead of just time. And that uh, makes it so I don't have to create a separate cyclic time. I'm going to do, I'm effectively creating the cyclic time as the input to the lookup table. And then the lookup table can be implemented on top of there. And it just makes it so I don't have to have three things. I could just have the shadow variable and the repeating pattern. From there, I can go to my as graph and I can create a lookup table that's only defined from zero to 12. And I create my repeating pattern of whatever I want to call this. Maybe this is water usage over the year. Uh, you know, energy usage over the year, whatever. And, um, and then uh, if I were to go out and then uh, simulate this thing and plot my repeating pattern, then I get my, that same pattern repeats every 12 months. And if I ran my sim for longer than 24, it would just keep repeating. So everybody see how I did that? Any questions about that? All right, so if seasonality comes up in your final project, it won't come up in E5 unless you want to add it as a bonus. But if it comes up in your final project, this is how you do seasonality without having to define like this pattern for the entire time block you're simulating. Okay. All right, so um, kind of looking ahead here, we've got, um, you know, so the next reading we have is this chapter eight. But as I say on the, um, the page on Canvas, um, you're only responsible for up to page 293. So chapter eight is kind of a long chapter and, um, and it gets a little bit off in the weeds. And so you're fine to read up through more of that, uh, but the perusal assignment will stop at 293. And that's all that I'm gonna be uh, you know, testing you on in the exercise and the assessment. So there's no need to read path 293, but you feel free to. Um, and then the last two chapters that we'll read between here and the end of the semester, are chapters nine and 10. So that's another option here. So um, assignment E5, I say distributed today, but that just means it's sort of formally assigned here. Um, this it's actually due the Sunday after the next class and Tuesday, we will spend the whole class working on the assignment. So um, we so you cut the class and, um, and it's basically gonna be a, a, a lab day. So um, I'll be here. 
and we can then work on it, you know, uh, as a group, well, not as a group, but I'll walk around and you can work on it. And if questions come up, then I'll be free to help out. Um, so, but you're free to get started on it, uh, you know, sooner than that. In fact, we have a little bit of time left here. So if you want to start today, that's fine too. Or if you want to get out of here earlier, that's fine as well. Then of course, do Sunday, we've got a muddiest point. And then this assignment E2 that's been around for a while. Um, if you, again, if you want to use the rest of the time today, you could also do that. Um, and I could help with any questions you have. And then, so again, next week, Tuesday, we'll work on E5 and it'll be due Sunday after that. And then um, chapter eight's due before lecture F1. So that's Thursday. And then, um, and then after that, uh, so this is kind of an important milestone between lectures F1 and F2. So that's a week from Tuesday. Then um, we'll have another kind of lab activity where uh, you with your group will have to demonstrate to me uh, at the by the end of the class period um, that you have a small like you know one sector um, working model of what your of some aspect of your final project just to show me that you're at least you've got some momentum started and um, and if you can't um, if and then that way if there's any errors that come up then I can help you try to deal with those errors and if by the end of the class period, you're not able to demonstrate to me a small, minimal working part of it, then you can upload a video by the Sunday after that so that I can review that video online to see that you've got some momentum going up. And so that's what's coming up. So work with your group on getting something on Canvas, not Canvas uh, LMS, but can the on your VinSim or your Insight Maker Canvas. Again, it doesn't have to be your whole model, but just like the first couple stocks to show that they're working in the right direction and you're not getting errors or weird things. And then our last two chapters, uh, nine will be due before F2 um, and then 10 will be due before F3. So um, any questions about any of this? Yeah. Um, uh, I checked that I, I, I don't want to misquote, but so check the syllabus and the canvas. Um, but, um, I think so that in this class, I've, I got the policy that one homework is dropped, but I don't want to misquote. Any other questions? Questions online? If not, then let me give you the attendance exercise. And then I think that's all I've got for you today. So if you want to stick around and work on anything and get any help from me, that's fine. If you want to take off and uh, start the, um, well, you know, if you want to take off and worry about E5 next week, that's also totally fine too. So let me uh, get here. So I'll put the link in the chat. And so the question I've got here is what, um, how would you describe modulus? So what does modulo mean? So if I said, um, or if you'd like, if you prefer, what is uh, 15 mod 12? So either one of those. So tell me what 15 mod 12 is, or just describe what modulo means. And that's all I've got. Any questions online? Yep. Yeah, in fact, the slides are already available and the video will be uploaded as soon as I can. Uh -huh. Yep. All right, so I will go ahead and stop the recording at least.